Merhabalar. Başlayabilir miyim şu anda Emre? Merhabalar herkese. Hello everyone. Today we have a guest speaker, uh, Sinem Erdoğan. Uh, she is uh, going to talk us talk um, to us about her research uh, on festivals. So before before I uh, we start talking, I would like to introduce Sinem Erdoğan iş korkutan. She uh, is uh, a scholar currently working at Ozean University and she uh, earned her PhD from Boğaziçi University Department of History in 2017. Her research focuses on the early modern Ottoman visual culture and Ottoman cultural history. Her PhD te- thesis presented the first comprehensive monograph on uh, Ottoman Imperial Festival. And it was awarded with the Boğaziçi University Scientific Research Fund Doctoral Dissertation Award. She received grants and scholarships from several institutions, including TÜBİTAK, <coughs> sorry, ARIT, and Boğaziçi University Research Fund, the Barakat Trust, and the Istanbul Research Institute. Sorry, I am so excited to introduce you, Sina. It's okay. <coughs> In 2017, she co-hosted the International Symposium on Ottoman Celebrations and Festivals at Yale University. Uh, in 2019, she co-edited a team special volume at the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Um, And then her articles appeared in the Medieval History Journal, the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, the Journal of Ottoman Studies, and most recently in Mukarnas. She is also the author of the book, The 1720, Imperial Circumcision Celebrations in Istanbul, Festivity and Representation in the Early 18th Century, published by Burrell. So we have this very young scholar with a lot of accomplishments. And I like to again, uh, you know, uh, remind you that we invited her for our uh, for our graduate course uh, at Kadiras University. Uh, this course focuses on arch- relationship between architecture and ritual. And we are very happy today to have our guest speaker, uh, Sinem Erdoğan. So Sinem, I'm... Uh, I, I thank you for coming here, and uh, we are very happy now to listen to you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much, Ufuk, for your introduction. I also would like to thank you for your kind invitation. It's a great pleasure joining you tonight under the framework of this lecture series. Uh, talk presents tonight, I will be talking about 1720 Imperial Festival, uh, and I will start with sharing my screen to show you my beautiful book paintings. Sorry. I will share right now my screen. And I hope now you can see it. Yes. In late July 1720, Sultan Ahmed III ordered his officials to organize a grand scale public festival in Istanbul on the occasion of the circumcision of his four sons. The last of its example in Ottoman history with its scale and cost, this festival would be one of the most famous imperial celebrations throughout the history of Ottoman dynasty. This public festival was part of a series of public imperial festivals that the court held during the reign of Ahmed III. In only three decades, the court held five wedding festivals and one circumcision festival. So... So in the early 18th century, we see a conspicuous use of urban ceremonial for royal image making. The most lavish and extensive among all was the circumcision celebrations that lasted for three weeks and was celebrated day and night, both within and outside the walled city. It included various rites, such as processions of the dignitaries, parades of the guildsmen, banquets, gift exchange rites circumcision of boys from the city folk and various performances. Thousands of people from the imperial city and from neighboring districts participated in this event as contributors and beneficiaries. 
Following the terminology first introduced to the study of festivals and rituals by Milton Singer, this imperial celebration was an extraordinary occasion, the so-called cultural performance, where various aspects of the Ottoman culture were encapsulated, enacted, and placed on display for itself and outsiders. We have unusually extensive record of documents to study various aspects of this imperial celebration. Two extensively illustrated festival books, namely Surnames, contemporary narratives, as well as thousands of archival documents that Ottoman central bureaucracy produced for this special occasion, provide us with a remarkably vivid picture on this festival. Thanks to these sources' content and diversity, and through their comparative as well as critical analysis in my book, I was able to reconstruct three main phases of the event and their minute details, referring to the planning, staging, and representation phases of the festival. In this talk, while sometimes referring to the details of these phases, I will be mostly focusing on the ceremonial sites of this grand scale public festival while discussing how these sites played a significant role in the structuring of the whole event. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the official announcement of the Imperial Festival was made in late July 1720. Documents show that the court officials were immediately preoccupied with festival preparations. The first act was to appoint a, a festival superintendent. For this duty, the dignitaries chose the superintendent of the imperial kitchens, El Haj Halil Efendi. His appointment marked the beginning of an intensive phase of festival preparations that lasted for 52 days, as opposed to the six months long preparations of the previous circumcision festival that was held at Edirne. During this phase, Festival officials initially surveyed earlier registers to determine the scheduling of events. Another major task was supplying of food products, copper utensils, tableware and kitchenware items, clothing pieces, as well as other necessary objects for the event. Furthermore, a group of craftsmen and attendants began to work for the preparation of mahals and candy gardens. In the meantime, some clerks started to register the names of various performers who would enact shows during the festival, as well as the names of uncircumcised boys across the city. And, as time of the inauguration approached, officials started working on the configuration and decoration of the festival sites. For the enactment of public celebrations, two sites which were located outside the vault peninsula seem to have been chosen. These were Ok Meydanı and Tersane Palace across the Golden Horn. As we see in this 17th century map, these sites were in close proximity to each other, so that the Sultan, his retinue and attendants could easily move between them on a daily basis. Indeed, while daytime celebrations were often held at Ok Meydanı, in the evening, officials were moving to the Golden Horn for the enactment of nighttime celebrations. Here we have another contemporary representation from a late 17th century album, preserved at that time at the Imperial Palace, and it also shows the affinity of these sites. Selection of these two sites rather than the Hippodrome, the major public ceremonial site of Istanbul, both during the Byzantine and Ottoman times, was certainly not coincidental. Especially in the 16th century, during the long reign of Sultan Suleiman I, the Hippodrome witnessed various royal weddings and circumcision festivals. In the last decades of the 16th century, particularly in 1582, Sultan Murad III also held a grand-scale circumcision festival there that lasted for 52 days. Visual representations of the 1582 Imperial Festival provides us information to grasp the configuration of the site. As one sees in Surname paintings, the Sultan was watching the shows from the balcony of Ibrahim Pasha Palace that faces the Hippodrome. 
the officials and guests were sitting on a loggia, which is seen on the right-hand page. And spectators, as well as performers, were standing on the ground level. Rather than using this old ceremonial site, the court decided to extend outside the walled city and across the waterfront for the public celebrations of the 1720 festival. I argue that the court's selection of sites outside the walled city signified broader transformations in the cityscape and in urban forms of sociability. This extension of the city extramuros was a phenomenon also noted by some contemporary authors since the 17th century. Authors such as Evliya Çelebi, Eremya Çelebi, Silahtar Mehmet, Rashid Mehmet frequently wrote about the increasing leisurely activities of the inhabitants of Istanbul and the royal family outside the Volt Peninsula at sites such as Kelatane, as well as along the shores of the city. Apart from that, the configuration of these new sites and the way in which the Sultan and his sons were represented within them also projected a novel imperial imagery. Thus, as I have mentioned at the introduction, these sites played a significant role in the structuring of the event and communicating certain messages related to the ideological dimensions of the occasion. As we understand from narrative and archival sources, officials and attendants started to transform these places into festival sites six days before the inauguration, on September 12, 1720, hence manipulating their daily use and function. To start with the main ceremonial site, most of the daytime and some of the nighttime shows were staged at Ok Meydanı offering a large open space to festival officials and dignitaries. Ok Meydanı was the place where the tents of the Sultan, Grand Vizier, high and middle ranking officials and various service units, as well as the corps of the military were pitched. According to festival narratives, those tents were pitched in a certain hierarchical order at Ok Meydanı. In this double page painting by Levni, we see the configuration of the site before the festival started. In the center of the right-hand page, we see the tent of the Sultan, surrounded by those of his retinues and by light barriers. In its vicinity, and still within this circle, there are two tents reserved for the banquets. As clearly described in festival narratives, the three-columned one was for the high-ranking participants, while the two-columned one was for the lower-ranking participants. Behind this area, we see Atıcılar Tekkesi, a lodge that was rearranged for the banquet that was offered to the female members from the urban folk on the 14th day of the event. Facing the tent of the Sultan and his attendants on the left page, Levni depicts the tent of the Grand Vizier, his attendants, tents belonging to other viziers, as well as court officials. Also, the tent of the circumcision was pitched there. The bottom left-hand side shows the tents of the corps of the military, and on the bottom right-hand side, we see service-related tents and those of the scribes. One can safely say that this configuration on the open space almost resembled the Ottoman military encampment. Given that, at that time, the court sought to distract attention from recent military failures, the mere physical appearance of those orderly tents should have symbolized military power and the Ottoman Empire. Actually, this idea of staging an imperial festival in an open space seems to have relied on the example of the 1675 Imperial Circumcision Festival held at Edirne. This festival had also been staged in an open space, namely Sırık Meydanı. However, Unlike the main ceremonial site of the 1720 festival, Sırık Meydanı was positioned next to the walls of the Edirne Palace. Indeed, as emerges from relevant sources, festival officials pitched only a limited number of tents, such as those of the Sultan, Grand Vizier, Viziers, guests and circumcised boys in this open space. 
In this contemporary drawing and plan by John Covell, who left an eyewitness account as well as some drawings on the event, we can have a glimpse into the configuration of the site. Next to the walls of the palace, we see the pitching of the tents of the Sultan, the Grand Vizier, other viziers and the service-related ones that were positioned in a crescent-like shape overlooking the open space reserved for the performers. So even if initially the idea of staging the festival in an open space might have relied on this earlier example, the planners of the 1720 festival seem to have gone beyond this idea towards establishing almost a military encampment at Okmaidana. Even the mere physical appearance of these orderly tents in the large open space seems to have created a visual spectacle for the urban folk. As I have mentioned before, the configuration of the site began six days before the inauguration, and various court units were preoccupied with this task. As archival documents show, some days later, the space was also illuminated with thousands of torches, lanterns and roof ridges, and we see the exact number of provisioning in the screen. An additional number of candles, as well as lanterns, were also distributed to the tents for the nighttime occasions. Even during this phase of preparations, Okmaidan ok was a place to be seen and visited. Indeed, an archival document verifies this assumption. The document, which is a Grand Vizier of Talhis, shows us that before the start of the festival, the resident envoys at the imperial capital sent a petition to the Ottoman court requesting the royal permission to visit the festival site and see the tents. At the left margin of the petition, one sees the imperial order of the Sultan that permitted all of them to go there and see. The use of the verb seyritsunar led them to look and see to define the visit of the envoys is worthy of note here, because since the early 16th century, contemporary authors and also clerks typically use the same verb and their related terms seyir and seyran to define various kinds of games and shows enacted by performer groups in Ottoman public celebrations. Hence, the orderly tents as well as all decorations and hangings of the festival site seem to have also been something to be seen and visited, thereby reinforcing the spectacular aspect of the event. The physical advantages of these sites, especially the main festival site on land, might have also been instrumental in the choice of the Sultan or the planners of the festival. All the narratives underrepresent the presence of the spectators at the festival site. One might still surmise that a huge urban crowd must have filled Okmaidana. Obviously, as opposed to the Hippodrome, Okmaidana presented a huge open space to the festival planners, which must have hosted a larger group of spectators. Indeed, pictorial narratives provide some insights into this point, as the painters filled their double-page compositions with many people, including dignitaries, attendants, performers, as well as urban spectators, including both men and women. Just to imagine the crowd of people that filled this open space, let me give you some numbers based on archival registers. Even if we do not know about the total number of the urban spectators, at least we know that thousands of court officials and attendants were on duty at the main ceremonial site. The, the, the site was served by over 5,000 attendants, including water bearers, cooks, imperial tasters, physicians, barbers, roof ridges, tray carriers, janissaries, palace pages, laundrymen, slaves, as well as performers. This list does not even include hundreds of attendants of the dignitaries who resided at the site, as well as the guests of the banquets and guildsmen who were invited on different days. One would also add over 4,000 boys who were circumcised throughout the course of the celebrations and their families to our list. It emerges that even those people made up over thousands of people.
Among those participants, the circumcised boys from among the urban folk deserve some attention. As noted in festival narratives, circumcising the poor and needy was the customary law during the imperial circumcision festivals. Hence, in the 1720 festival, each day, a certain number of boys from the city of Hawk were circumcised. We have unusually detailed information on these boys, as three extensive books of registers, as well as over 2,000 petitions, provide rich information about their identities, ancestral names, and their residency patterns. My extended analysis on these registers still continues, and discussing all the details exceeds the concerns of this talk. But to put it very briefly, these were mostly residents of the walled city, and many boys came also from districts such as Galata, Kasım Pasha, and Beşiktaş. In addition, 40 boys were from the neighboring villages of the Bosphorus, while 16 boys were from the other villages close to the imperial capital. In addition, 17 further boys came from the nearby cities such as Edirne, Tekirdağ, İznikmit, and Bursa. In one of the books of registers, as we see on the right-hand side in the screen, the clerks categorized the circumcised boys into eight groups depending on the district they came from, while following an order, which follows Üsküdar, Beşiktaş, Bındıklı, Tophane, Galata, Kasım Pasha, Istanbul, and last the Eyüp Ensari. Along with providing information on the names of the neighborhoods in the affiliated districts within or outside the walled city, the document also specified the names of some particular locations, such as fountains, marketplaces, bachelor rooms, lodges, hammams, and streets, hence drawing a vivid picture of the urban space of Istanbul of the early 18th century. Based on that register, this preliminary map is made during my research assistance under a project supervised by Cidam Kafescioğlu and in collaboration with Kadiras University Istanbul Studies Center. In this initial stage, basically it shows us the residency patterns of these boys while providing at least an insight into the extension of this festival of the intra and extra muros of the city. Going back to the festival sites, for the majority of the nighttime spectacles, the officials had preferred the Tersane Palace across the Golden Horn. Tersane Palace was an excursion spot for the royal family at least from the early 17th century onwards. Contemporary sources indicate that, with additional constructions that were made during the reigns of Ibrahim I and Mehmed IV respectively, the complex had been enlarged. Indeed, in March 1678, after a fire that broke out at the harem part of the palace, which then reached the grilled kiosk as we see in the images, the complex had been renovated. After a year, as Tilahtar Mehmet Ar writes, in February 1679, the court had arranged a spectacle at the shores of the Golden Horn to celebrate the return of Mehmet IV from the Polish campaign. The guilds of the city had paraded in front of the Tersane Palace with smaller scale models of their workshops located over floating rafts. So staging some parts of the 1720 festival at the shores of the Golden Horn was perhaps the pinnacle of this new trend. As has been mentioned before, the Sultan, the dignitaries and their retinues were moving between the two sides almost on a daily basis. This move started with the inauguration of the festival, which was marked by a procession of the Sultan towards Okmeydana. This procession started from the Tersane Palace, where the Sultan was residing during the timeline of the festival with his family. According to the textual narratives on that day, the Sultan was accompanied by his courtiers and some members of the corps of the military. The high-ranking members of the religious hierarchy and viziers were waiting for him at Okmeydana. Ok 
in the pictorial representation of this particular episode that unusually extends to four double pages without the interruption of the text, one sees the moment when this group arrived at Ok Meydana. I want to mention at this point that, according to festival narratives, actually Grand Vizier Damat Ibrahim Pasha was also waiting for the Sultan at the main festival site, so he did not participate in this procession. However, as we see here, the patron or project supervisor chose to depict the Grand Vizier on horseback as if he participated in this very significant moment of the festive events that integrated the public ceremonies. In addition to the physical advantages of these sites, I argue that their configuration also symbolized the new self-image of the court and dynasty. As depicted in the paintings and retold in festival narratives, on the large open ground of Ok Meydana, the Sultan's tent was not strictly separated from other tents. Although it was surrounded by light barriers, both textual and visual evidence suggest that those barriers were frequently removed. Hence, while watching the performances from his tent, or sometimes from a portable kiosk referred to as the kiosk of watching, the Sultan was always visible to the public. Similarly, in all of the images, one also sees the princes, who are often depicted in the center of the compositions nearby the Sultan. When the festival was held across the Golden Horn, the Sultan was watching the shows from the balcony of the Pearl Kiosk of the Tarsana Palace, and his sons were again depicted by his side. As festival paintings show, he was again visible to the performers passing in front of the kiosk on floating rafts and to urban spectators watching the shows from boats or from the shores. The configuration of the 1720 festival sites, as well as the visible public imagery of the Sultan and the Princess, stand in contrast to what we see in 1582 Imperial Festival, where the Sultan was always spatially secluded from the rest of the spectators and dignitaries. As we see in the Surname paintings, there is a tripartite spatial hierarchy in the site among the Sultan, dignitaries, and urban spectators. While the Sultan watched the event from the balcony of the palace, dignitaries and guests sat on a loggia on the lower level, and urban spectators and get, uh, performers sorry, were standing on the ground level. As far but as the iconography of Prince Mehmet is concerned, whenever the crown prince appears in 1582 Surname paintings, he is barely recognizable in the composition, as his face and body are not depicted in full. Besides the physical seclusion of the Sultan from the rest of the people, he was depicted uniformly in the same place and almost as an immobile figure. This secluded and iconic imagery of the Sultan was in fact parallel to the codifications in Ottoman court ceremonial between the mid and late 16th century, which dwelled on the notion of imperial seclusion of the Sultan. A comparison of this earlier pictorial representation with the paintings of the 1720 festival reveals important changes in the projection of imperial identity. These show that both the selection and configuration of sites of the 1720 festival and the representation of the Sultan and royal family within these places symbolized broader socio-political and urban transformations. After the configuration of festival sites, the public celebration started on September 18 and lasted for two weeks. This public phase of the celebrations included various rites, such as banquets offered each day to a different group of participants, gift-giving occasions, referring to both gifts given by the Sultan to dignitaries, as well as those customary gifts presented by officials and guildsmen to the Sultan, and extended parades of the city's guildsmen. Besides, various shows and displays were enacted by a large group of performers as we see their names and numbers on the screen. 
These performers had come from the western provinces of the empire, and some were the residents of the imperial capital. Every day, these performers, including groups of musicians, singers, dancers, shadow players, jugglers, acrobats, tightrope workers, firework masters, and animal trainers, enacted many wondrous things. In addition, the members of the corps of the military, such as the imperial armory and artillery, also enacted some shows especially mock battles. As we learn from the festival narratives, while watching these games and shows, urban spectators would put their fingers in their mouths as a sign of their astonishment. After weeks-long festivities staged outside the walled peninsula, the court returned to the walled city in early October, and the circumcision of boys from the city folk continued in the first courtyard of the imperial palace for about a week. Then, the time came for the circumcision of the princess at the imperial palace, which would literally end the 1720 festival. As the public dimension of this concluding rite, the court staged a magnificent procession which seemed to have symbolized a return to the center of the walled city. In performance studies, the closing rites were especially important in framing the whole composite event and in conveying the intended messages of the commissioners and organizers. In the 1720 festival, the circumcision procession seems to have been chosen as this important closing rite, although in previous circumcision festivals it was typically scheduled for a different day. This procession was referred to in the contemporary sources as the imperial procession, and it began with the departure of the princes from the old palace in the company of hundreds of officials, and it ended at the imperial palace, where the princes would be circumcised the next day. While this procession symbolized the prince's rite of passage from boyhood to manhood, at the same time, it marked the visual and social distinctions between the officials of the state and common folk, as well as demonstrating the power and wealth of the court and dynasty. Hundreds of officials participated in this procession, as their names and identities were carefully mentioned in the official festival narrative. Parallel to the detailed description of the textual narrative, this extended procession was conceived in 16 and 17 double-page images in the paintings, illustrated by Levni and Ibrahim, respectively. Here we see Ibrahim's serial imagery of the closing procession. As they did not fit in a single row, I divided the images into four rows and procession goes from upright to left and continues in such in the following rows. As recorded in the festival narratives, this closing procession departed from the old palace at the heart of the city. And it passed through the districts of Vezneciler, Sarachane, Horhor, and Aksaray, turned onto the Divanyolu, and then marched in front of Lalili Çeşme, Darpane Yatik, Valide Hamamı, and Arslanane, before finally reaching the new palace. In this reconstructed map, we see the road of the procession. It emerges that, as opposed to the circumcision processions performed during the 1530, 1539, or 1582 festivals, where the group only marched between the Old Palace and the Hippodrome, referring approximately to points between A and C in map, for the 1720 festival, the road was significantly extended. The Sultan did not attend in this procession. Rather, he watched it from the workshop of the imperial painter designers Nakashane Hassa that was near to Arslanane and in close proximity to the imperial palace. During this procession, while hundreds of officials as well as princes were marching through the streets of the old city, visual and material display also reached a peak. Indeed, the display of candy gardens and nahls was also incorporated into this very last moment of the festival, possibly to further highlight the pomp. 
as symbols of fertility, wealth, and status. For each prince, the court commissioned one kindergarten, ten small nahals, and one big nahal. These were constructed through the work of over 150 urban craftsmen who were divided into 19 different groups, as we see in this list. These were truly magnificent objects with huge dimensions. Documents indicate that large nahls were 21 meters in length and the base of the kindergartens measured 6 square meters. After their construction, eventually, these objects were adorned by luxuries such as an excessive amount of sugar, wax, silk textiles, gold, silver, as well as fresh flowers and spices. Hence, they embodied the splendor of this extraordinary event for which they were made. This ceremonial return to the center of the old city with, with a spectacular manifestation of pomp and hierarchy certainly had semiotic meanings. Closing the public ceremonies of this grand-scale celebration at the center of the old city seems to have signified ceremonial continuity with the past. Indeed, the final destination of the procession was the imperial palace that was in theory the political and ceremonial hub of the empire and the city. Then closing the whole cycle of festival events at the imperial palace must have symbolized the central position of the palace in the overall state hierarchy. Even if during this period it was neither the center of administrative affairs nor of the patronage mechanisms. To sum up my talk, as I discussed tonight, the public celebrations of the 1720 festival were unusually staged beyond the walled city at two different sites. At the end of the event, however, the festival returned to the heart of the walled city. Actually, this blend of the tradition and novelty was also observed in some other aspects of the festival, such as its protocol rules and morphology, as well as in other cultural and artistic predilections of the court at this particular period, when stressing continuity with the past, as well as appropriating novel forms, were of great significance for the Ottoman court. And I argued that the ceremonial sites of the event perfectly articulated and represented the novel predilections of the court and the dynasty in the early 18th century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sina, very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, I'm impressed by the variety and quality of images. You know, it's such a well-documented festival. I wasn't expecting something like that. So, uh, you know, I, I welcome the questions from the speakers. Sure. But before... Maybe I can ask a question. I because I'm kind of foreign to the Ottoman history, you know. I like to ask why is the reason for this choice of new sites in Okmedan and Halic? Yes. Maybe it's a very basic question. Yes. I explained it already. Well, still, I, I, is it like the city expanded during yes. that time? Yeah. Yeah, one reason, one obvious reason is that the city was already expanding uh, throughout the 17th century and 18th Imagine. century uh, is, is let, let's say, the, the manifestation of this trend. Uh, this is one aspect of it. And another one is the increasing leisurely activities of the inhabitants of Istanbul beyond the walled city, uh, at the shores of the city. And uh, contemporary authors write about this trend since the early 17th century, that both the inhabitants of the city and the royal family, uh, they were um, moving to excursion spots outside the walled city, and especially uh, at the shores of the city. So this is a related uh, trend uh, to the extension, uh, urban extension of the city. This is another aspect. And one practical reason is uh, the space. The, the walled city uh, did not have such a large open space to, 
to mm -hmm. um com to, for the configuration of a large military encampment and and hippodrome presented as i tried to explain a, a, a limited space for um these urban uh, group and for the extended bureaucracy in the 18th century we see that various branches of the court um greatly extended and at oak maiden uh, we see such a manifestation um uh, because all the tens tens of uh, dozens of tents were distributed to the open space and you see the extension of the bureaucracy as well as the, the courts of the military. So it's both a manifestation of uh, military power. At the same time, it shows you how various branches of the Ottoman bureaucracy, court central bureaucracy had extended in the 18th century. The whole mm -hmm. city did not have such a large open space normally. Uh, this is a practical reason uh, that yeah. I... I could find out. Yeah. And also because I guess the procession could walk throughout the city, it would provide a longer, um, I mean, a uh, longer processional route for the display of the power of the emperor, I guess. A procession was, was in the uh, heart of the city. Heart and of just the city. like. Yeah, just like the other processions. So uh, to this end, I interpreted this as a return to the tradition because for this oh, particular okay. procession, they turned to the old city because also in the earlier uh, ceremonies, earlier festivals, uh, such processions were held in, within the city, between the old palace and hippodrome. However, for this oh, case, okay. they had extended the road. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I was trying to uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they extended, as you said, they possibly extended the road to further emphasize the pomp uh, of this procession so that sure. uh, it would it would last uh, for hours and the narratives from the narratives one can understand that the procession started early in the morning and then when the procession reached to the imperial palace it was already uh, afternoon uh, of course they do not mention how many hours it, it took quite naturally but it must have taken uh, hours to complete this uh, procession with the participation of hundreds of people in the very narrow streets of the old city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any Thank other you. questions? Um, hi, uh, I'm not sure if I missed it. Uh, you told that the participants, uh, the boys and uh, their families were from within the city, uh, within the walls. Both uh, walls and outside the city, both. Okay, um, so what was it, uh, for them, was it uh, a prestigious thing to participate or was it uh, for monetary issues uh, that they couldn't have uh, a separate circumcision? Did they wait uh, for this event? Well, highly possibly the second one because... Um, um, Providing circumcision for boys uh, was was not something that all families could afford because in these registers we can also uh, understand the ages of these boys. Some of some of the boys were at the age of 14, 15, quite old for uh, the circumcision. So we can understand that basically it was something related to the um, financial constraints of the families. So this was an opportunity uh, that their sons could uh, could get a circumcision for free. At the same time, I didn't mention here, but these boys were given a kind of a clothing package as a gift. The Sultan, uh, the officials of the Sultan was distributing uh, such clothing clothing packages and in these clothing back packages you see um, um, like, sh like shoes, a kind of a t-shirt and and then uh, trousers and even affording new uh, trousers, a new shoe for, for a boy. Uh, this was something um, uh, that many families could not afford at this period. But uh, this doesn't mean that all the families uh, were poor or they could not afford for circumcision because there are times titles of the fathers in the registers. So we understand that not only, let's say, quote-unquote, poor families, but also um, um, middle-ranking officials took this as an opportunity to circumcise their sons, uh, the, the guildsmen um, in the city. Some of the guildsmen uh, had well to do, were in well-to-do economic uh, situation, but still they wanted it. And not only these, but also higher-ranking officials uh, circumcised their boys. And for the higher-ranking officials, it was some 
something prestigious to circumcise their sons along with the princess. And of course, these boys were not uh, circumcised in the same spot with the princess, but still, in theory, they were circumcised in the same um, festival along with the princess. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, for the high-ranking uh, members of the military and of the bureaucracy, as you said, uh, it was more related to the prestigious aspect of the event. For example, Grand Vizier Damat Ibrahim Pasha, uh, also, uh, he, one of his sons, was, uh, um, his name, name was Mehmet, he was also circumcised along with the princess. And, and of course, he was given a very luxurious clothing package, and his package was not like the package given to the urban folk, but his son uh, was also among the circumcised boys. I hope this uh, explains, uh, gives an explanation to your question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Do you have uh, this, with this accounts of the circumcision festival, do they come from the court archives or do you have any narratives belonging to like more local people, participants or like, uh, ordinary people, I mean, or is it only from the court archives you mention or, rec or narrate the story of the circumcision? Archival records, uh, they all come from um, the court archives. archives. Uh, they were produced uh, by mainly two uh, offices, or let's say, bureaucratic offices. One, uh, the chief finance office, and the second, the office of the uh, festival superintendent. They were producing these voluminous records. For festival narratives, still, uh, there are two festival narratives. One is the illustrated one. Uh, it was commissioned by the court and written by a bureaucrat of the time. So again, it, uh, it, uh, it, it focuses on uh, the, let's say, um, the might of the event. And it projects us the, uh, the agenda of the commissioners of the Sultan, of the Grand Vizier, not of common people. And there's another record. And this author is let's say, is in the middle because um, uh, the, another uh, narrative source was written by the preacher of festival superintendent. And his uh, narrative is less detailed and, and very short. And it, um, it gives us some glimpses into uh, the details that uh, were omitted by the official narrative of the festival. But, but still, this was also a commission given by a court bureaucrat. Unfortunately, we do not have a source written by an ordinary uh, observer uh, on this yeah. occasion. I think this is a very interesting question because uh, we are at the beginning of uh, Lale Devri, how do you say, the Tulip era? Yes. And uh, it is a propaganda event, and uh, all the recordings are produced or commissioned by the court. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, it's it's interesting to see that there are no um, outsider uh, testimonials that have remained, but also it's easier for the court archives to reach to us than other other people's um, writings. But actually, it is quite typical for Ottoman celebrations. Uh, we do not have uh, records uh, written by ordinary people. Sometimes we have uh, accounts written by European observers. But for this festival, unfortunately, we do not have such an extended uh, record. For example, for the previous uh, festival held at Edirne, we have uh, one record written by uh, by uh, a British man, and uh, this is a very extended um, uh, narrative uh, on the festival. Unfortunately, for this festival, we do not have it, um, uh, and this is this is quite typical. We do not have uh, such uh, sources from ordinary people um, talking about these uh, festivals uh, or imperial um, celebrations. Uh, this is quite common. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions? No, I have a question. Yeah. First of all, um, Sinam, finally I managed to listen to your presentation. It Hi, was amazing. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, and Ufuk, thanks for inviting me. And I was really excited. You know, this time I, uh, 
I was able to make it. Yeah. And um, I have two questions, actually. One of them is, you know, Tulip era has always been associated with westernization and sometimes, you know, looking towards east and west. Uh, so did you see any kind of um, influences from either Iran or from Europe uh, that kind of converges um, this ceremony from the older ones? And the, the second question is, I don't know much about the wedding ceremonies, but uh, do we have records of it? Does it really uh, diverge from the tradition as well in this, in this manner, in this, mm -hmm. like, in this circumcision festival? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nilay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, the first question is a very good question. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, normally I go into deeply uh, discussing this concept of tulip age, uh, but to put it very briefly, um, well, for this festival, uh, rather than um, influences from the West or from the East, I argue that the major concern was revising the tradition as far as the general morphology and as far as the organ general organization of the festival is concerned. I have dozens of documents um, and copies, exact copies made from the previous circumcision festival and the officials just try to make sure that they would follow the same exact order with the previous festival. And the morphology dwelled on the same, uh, on the previous festival and protocol rules and, and anything and everything. But there are slight changes, for example, in the protocol rules uh, regarding the, uh, the, the foreign envoys, because, you know, during these festivals, some, some envoys, uh, resident envoys were also invited. Uh, in this case, for the first time in this festival, we see that for the foreign envoys, a specific tent was reserved and chairs, instead of sitting on the tent as, as, um, as the, the other Ottoman officials, chairs were uh, both purchased and I have a record of it, 12 chairs were purchased for this purpose and we have a, a pictorial representation of it indeed. And not only this, a different menu was uh, prepared for the envoys. I also I know about the menu bec because for example, normally fish was not served uh, to the uh, participants and to the dignitaries, but for them, specifically a certain kilogram of uh, assorted fish were purchased uh, and a kind of a fish dish was uh, offered to the guests. And also the, some of the performances were um, were changed according to their taste because in the narrative they be says that Frankish style music in Rahevi Makam was performed in front of their tent. So you can have a glimpse on it. So it doesn't, let's say, characterize the overall organization of the festival, uh, all protocol rules or uh, the morphology. However, you can get a glimpse on it. But apart from that, we do not uh, see such an influence. Uh, rather, I, as I said, uh, following the tradition seemed to have been significantly stressed. But uh, also, as you also know, uh, in the pictorial representations, you see a blend of the Western style uh, painting with the uh, Ottoman um, painting forms. And here also we see this kind of a blend. But other than this, uh, no. So this, that, and from this, I will relate to the tulip page. I'm very critical of it. And I just do not use the term at all because I argue that there is no such a tulip age. And, uh, and this fest, if this festival was the most, let's say, um, uh, significant cultural event of this period, as the sources write, uh, I'd say that for this festival, we do not see such an emphasis on innovation or appropriation from the West, only in very um, small points, as I try to explain. So this was uh, my answer to your uh, first question. And for wedding ceremonies, actually, we have records. We have surnames devoted to wedding ceremonies as well. Um, for example, uh, on the previous uh, festival, uh, the festival of, of uh, 1675, the wedding uh, ceremonies were much more extended than the circumcision one. And uh, similarly, we have surnames on it. Just we do not have an illustrated uh, surname on any of the wedding ceremonies. And in the 18th century, we have a, a number of wedding uh, ceremonies, as I said. And for each one, we have a, a short 
uh, Suriname, in which mainly we learn about um, uh, the uh, the participants and how the processions progressed and um, and the details of the gifts presented to the bride, things like that. So they are not as um, detailed as the text of uh, Vehti. And uh, I think this is my um, uh, second answer, if uh, you do not have any uh, comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, maybe I can ask uh, something. Um, Sinam, first of all, thank you for this wonderful thank talk. Uh, it was always, I mean, as always, it's all, again uh, a joy that to listen to you and to your uh, marvelous work. Uh, I might have missed some of the points, but uh, following uh, a question that Nilay asked and then uh, maybe Ufuk asked earlier, I'm curious about how this, uh, let's say, uh, this this book and actually these uh, ceremonies actually themselves uh, add up to our understanding of the uh, 18th century Istanbul at large. Mm -hmm. uh, because while saying this, I have in mind, uh, first of all, I have in mind uh, the, the project that you were uh, briefly mentioned, that you were uh, working on these uh, children and their origins in the city. So you have uh, shown us a very beautiful map. I think you were tracing their origins. In, from, so that's, that's from a social level. Uh, how does it add up to our understanding of the city in terms of maybe population, in terms of let's say settlement patterns uh yeah and while asking this i have this uh the the of course the books by uh shirin hamade and tulay artan the article by tulay artan where the bosphorus is becoming more and more uh used at that period and the city is growing and also and in addition to that uh i have another question again uh from the uh from the same readings i remember that uh, the visibility of the and uh, visibility of the ottoman elite also was a, was a significant issue. You briefly mentioned the visibility and non-visibility of the Ottoman Sultan in, in different ceremonies, like from 16th century and 18th century, but um, how is it reflected on the urban ground uh, with, from the perspective of these ceremonies that, because Tuleyar, you know, Tuleyartan mentions about the visibility of the female members mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the imperial family or Shirin Hamade also mentions about them. So. How does it actually, uh, in th from that perspective, the visibility of the uh, Ottoman elite on the shores of like uh, Golden Horn, on the Bosphorus? So how does your work uh, kind of get into, I think there's a lot of connections. I, I, I Maybe it's very difficult to outline them shortly, but I, if I, I, I kind of sensed a lot of connections. So do you see this as a larger urban project as well? I mean, my question is rather uh, this in, in a larger perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I will start with the second one of the visibility of the imperial family and uh, the Ottoman elite. Um, uh, well, yes, uh, what we see in this festival, especially in, in the pictorial representations, what we read in the narratives, they are very parallel to what we, we know about um, this trend in the secondary literature from the studies, as you mentioned. Yes, uh, here we do not see imperial uh, women um, a lot in this particular um, festival. However, in the, the festivals that were held during the reign of Ahmed the, uh, the third, uh, there are a number of wedding festivals, as I say. So you see uh, the visibility of royal women in the urban space. Yes, they were not, their face, of, of course, was not visible. However, they were marching through the streets of the city and, and uh, in only three decades, you see that five wedding festivals were held. This is unusual in Ottoman uh, history, unprecedented almost. So we see a number of uh, such festivals uh, during the early reign of Suleiman the first, but his reign is more than 40 years. So in almost, uh, let's say, um, 10 year period, you see in, in 1708, 1709, 1710, you see uh, festivals. And then we see 1720 festival in 1721, 20, 24, we have another one, wedding festival. So there you can see that the, the royal women uh, were 
these the, these members, female members of the family, were becoming more visible in the urban space through these extended processions as well. And uh, this also refers to the Shehzades because normally we know that in from the 16th century, um, late 16th century, 17th century, they were almost invisible figures. So they were not. Um, um, visible in the urban space. As I try to just explain it through the pictorial representations, even in Suriname paintings, so Prince Mehmet's face is barely recognizable and this continues throughout 400 um, uh, miniature paintings. So he was consciously depicted as such like half. However, in this festival, in the pictorial representations, you can see that even almost in each images nearby the Sultan, you see almost one Shehzade or two Shehzade and the, even the opening page of the um, uh, opening uh, painting let's say of the 1720 Suriname is, is is it and this uh, um, in this painting we see again the depiction of the Shehzades nearby the Sultan as they visited the old palace so this is something that we do not see before and certainly it is parallel to the growing visibility of the imperial family um, in the 18th century as we know uh, from uh, the secondary studies and uh, the first question is broader uh, uh, i think and uh, not uh, very easy to answer and um, but of course we can see from this residency patterns of the boys it provides a, a invaluable information to understand um, uh, the uh, the urban space at this period and uh, from their residency patterns you can understand the extension of the city both to the Bosphorus as I just tried to explain and also uh, in the uh, districts extramuros but you see that uh, uh, dozens of boys came from uh, Qasım Pasha and Beşiktaş and Üsküdar from all these places and even in the uh, even from the villages of the Bosphorus you can see the, the extension of the city. But uh, we should be cautious because this is a very limited data of only 4,000 boys. And there are various other questions that I have in mind related to their social origins because there are titles of the fathers, whether uh, I can see like an um, relation between the titles of the fathers and the residency patterns of the boys. And basically, this is not clear cut, but as an observation, I can say that uh, the sons of guildsmen, they are mostly the residents of the walled city. Uh, however, when we talk about middle ranking officials or uh, boys uh, whose father didn't just have any title or status conferring um, title, they come from extra muros. But this is a broad observation and, and uh, I need to um, uh, concentrate more and more on uh, these and and still uh, I could not locate some of the um, neighborhoods or uh, urban places that are mentioned in the sources because um, I am looking at all the known narrative sources, maps and anything I could find to locate the exact place uh, mentioned in the registers but sometimes it is very difficult as you know uh, to locate the exact um, uh, place um, for this reason. Uh, this is another reason why this um, research still continues. Um, so this was my uh, second answer to your question. Thank you, thank you. Very enlightening answers, thank you. Okay, um, any other questions? Uh-oh. So, uh, I just wanted to ask if maybe a final question. Are there any, because in, when I, I study the ancient festivals, there is usually some, in some festivals, there are like revolts or there are disruptions to the general, um, you know, layout of the festival. The, usually because these are kind of events where all the public come together, you know, so it's also an occasion for the public to express their negative emotions. Mm -hmm. Do we have any such record of a revolt or a kind of, you know, disruption? Well, um, 
for revolts or disruption? No, this festival no. was a very well, let's say, controlled festival. For example, over 2,000 Janissaries were specifically selected as guards uh, uh, and they resided at the festival sites. And 18th century is also a period when we see this going uh, state control uh, uh, and uh, surveillance um, that extends. But we have examples of it, for example, in 1582, festival we know that the festival uh, abruptly ended because there was a, a, a fight between two groups of the Janissaries and then one Janissary was killed and then the festival uh, abruptly uh, ended. Uh, for, this is the case for 16th century one. So here we do not have it uh, because it was, as I said, a very well controlled festival. However, we have kind of um, uh, social, let's say, discontent, cases that shows us social discontent related to the preparation of this festival. I didn't mention here. However, um, urban groups were under heavy obligations, such as providing their copper utensils, uh, their tableware items uh, and, and also churches of the city, Armenian and Orthodox Greek churches were also obliged to, to give their copper utensils to the festival kitchen and also guildsmen had to present uh, um, gifts to the Sultan but these were obligatory gifts because I have a book of register in which before the festival the court officials indicated that this guild will present this um, gift and this guild will, will present this Give. So these, um, let's say, obligations related to the material aspect of the festival uh, and these uh, obligations related um, uh, to, to preparing gifts, they created kind of a discontent among, among especially uh, the, um, uh, the guildsmen. I have some records, for example, a discontent case was recorded between the Guild of uh, Şerbetçiler and the Guild of Bakkal, uh, Bakkalan. And Şerbetçiler refused to pay their contribution fee to uh, prepare Sultan's gifts. They said that we will not contribute because four years before we had uh, given money for the preparation of four tents for the military campaign. And then, but the the, um, the, um, the Guild of Grocers, Bakal July, said, no, you have to pay. Then they went to Kadir. And then uh, we learn about it. Uh, in the end, the um, previous registers were surveyed. And we have their uh, details. And then Kadı said that, uh, okay, bakkallar will uh, cover the cost of uh, the group of şerbetçiler. And I have some other cases like this among the guildsmen, and I could understand that. Meeting these uh, obligations, uh, this was um, disadvantageous, and this was... Um, um, uh, hard for some of the, the guilds, especially the guilds that did not have um, high levels of income. And also I know that I have a document in which uh, the, the church of the Armenian churches of the city, Kilise is the term used in the document, they were supposed to contribute like thousands of copper utensils. But then there is an, another document in which I can see that they, um, in the end, they gave only the half. So this also, we do not know about the background, whether there was a kind of negotiation between the court officials and the church initiatives and what happened. I do not know about the background, but then I can understand that. Even also the churches, they didn't want to give all their copper utensils to the festival officials because they would not be able to take back their utensils because these uh, borrowed objects turned to their original owners after a year time. I have another register uh, in which uh, the dates were recorded and I can understand that um, when uh, the objects returned to their original places. So we have this kind of discontents, let's say, glimpses into it, but not revolts and dis disruptions in this festival. Okay, thank you. Very interesting, thank you know, you have such little and very interesting details about and it's a lot of work actually to co yeah. combine and bring together all these details thank you very much yeah, may i ask you. another question do we have time yeah, yeah we have there are time. no one else uh sinem kim i'm i'm curious about the role of damat ibrahim pasha i mean uh -huh. how how he was depicted was it different from the previous ones his roles because i i mean i see him sometimes more visible or more yeah. central than the sultan himself yeah. to create any kind of conflict whatsoever 
yeah. if you have any comments yes on that. yes sure nina again um a very important point uh, that i focus a lot in my book normally my book i all all the time just focus on the person of the Dhamma, Tibrahim Pasha, because I argue that uh, the real commissioner of this festival, as well as the Surnames, was Dhamma, Tibrahim Pasha. And we can say that Surnames, totally, both text and the imagery, they totally focus on the image of Dhamma, Tibrahim Pasha. Uh, and his imagery holds such a central position uh, in the imagery that sometimes overshadows Sultan, as, as you said. And, uh, and in the text, you can understand that he was also concerned with the content of the text. He was interfering to the content and saying the author, did you add this to the text? And di did you mention this in the text? And in the imagery, um, uh, there are some scenes that just focus on the, on the Dhamma Tibrahim Pasha. You do not see Sultan at all. And sometimes there are episodes in the text and then you have their images that when reading the text, you do not understand why this episode is that much focused and, and emphasized in the text. Then you understand that uh, Sayyid Behbi just wanted to uh, emphasize his real patron. Indeed, Sayyid Behbi was a figure close to Damat Ibrahim Pasha. They had worked before this festival. And highly probably, Damat Ibrahim Pasha chose Sayyid Behbi for this specific um a commission and they they were very close so uh, and um in the uh, very last uh, episode that is mentioned in the text uh, and i think this is very important so we have the circumcision of the princess at the imperial palace and then all the dignitaries leave palace one by one and then the text narrative finishes with an episode and it says that damat ibrahim pasha started to walk to the second gate of the palace while distributing gold coins to his side, to his left and right. Then he left the palace uh, with his horse. So this closes the textual narrative. However, uh, I am sure you know the, the last image of these tsunamis. In the last image of these tsunamis, you see Sultan Ahmed III in the, in the fourth courtyard of the imperial palace while distributing gold coins to the members of the, uh, you know, inner members of the court but this is an imaginary scene uh, so you see a, uh, you see a dichotomy between the textual narrative and the pictorial narrative and I argue that uh, both the commissioner because yes even if the commissioner held such an importance in this uh, text also you see that um, Sayyid Behbi always tried to justify the power and might of the Dhamati Ibrahim Pasha by saying that he was very powerful, but he was subordinate to the Sultan. So he, they all always tried to keep this balance, of course, because Sultan was his patron. And so I argue that this dichotomy between the text and image uh, shows us this um, two-folded um, power, um, uh, let's say, uh, struggle on one hand. So even if in the text generator you see it, for the very last image that one would see at the last of the um, uh, Surname, it was not uh, thought appropriate uh, because uh, closing the imagery with an image uh, of Damati Rahim Pasha distributing gold coins would be against the idea of uh, the Sultan's benefaction because, in theory, uh, the circumcision festival developed on the concept of Sultan's benefaction. However, this case also shows me the central position and very powerful imagery of Damati Ibrahim Pasha. Uh, in the representations of this festival. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we are reaching the end of our um, talk for today. Uh, if no one has any more questions. Thank you, Sinan, very much thank for you. participating. And thank you, our audience as well, for their uh, questions and their participation as well. I hope to... See you all for in a future talk. So we continue this series of intellectual um, coming together. You know, thanks again for everybody. Thank you very much for all of have, you. Have a good night. Good night.